moss-draped country roads, to its fertile prairie lands, to its pristine swamps and bayous, Southwest Louisiana is renowned for being the land of the Cajuns. And if there's one thing for which Cajuns themselves are famous, it is that they know how to have a good time. The cries of Ils sont partis and Laissez les bon temps rouler are often heard and are well known, as is the Cajun love for good food and especially good music. Both traditional Cajun and Zydeco music were born in the heart of Louisiana's Acadiana region. But perhaps the most nationally popular type of music to hail from this area is a mixture of traditional Cajun, country, rhythm and blues, and rock and roll. A style called Swamp Pop. One of the progenitors of this type of music is singer and musician Rod Bernard, who made the charts in the late 50s and 60s with such hits as A London Se Colinda, One More Chance, Pardon Mr. Gordon, and his most remembered tune of all, this should go on forever. Rod was born in Opelousas, Louisiana, a small agricultural community in St. Landry Parish. Once the state capital of Louisiana during the Civil War, Opelousas now boasts itself as the yam capital of the world. It was once a town rich in vegetable processing and shipping, possessing numerous cotton gins, a moss factory, and a large sawmill, with a market strong in sweet potatoes, cotton, and other agrarian products. Like many of the inhabitants of Opelousas, Rod came from a traditionally French-speaking family. However, he proved to be a member of the first generation of his own family to speak no French at all. Man, communicating with my great-grandmother was a real problem because she spoke no English at all and I spoke no French. My grandparents spoke English and French much better at French. Mom and Dad spoke both languages, but the only time I remember them talking French in front of the kids was when they didn't want us to know what they were talking about. When I started school in 1946, most of the kids in my class were bilingual. However, the teachers thought that they'd be a lot smarter if they learned how to speak proper English. We were discouraged from speaking French. In fact, we were punished if we were caught talking French. As I grew older, I realized that was a big mistake. I really wish in growing up we would have been allowed to learn both languages. It would have been much better for my career both in radio, television, and also in music. Rod was reared like any other boy his age. He enjoyed sports and excelled in boxing, which remained a hobby of his throughout his high school years. Neither of his parents were involved with music, yet, at the age of eight, he became interested in playing guitar. Rod explains how he obtained his first instrument. As long as I can remember, I was fascinated with music and records, Victrolas, and radio. And I came home from school one day and told my dad I wanted a guitar. And I was about eight years old, and I think he figured that it was one of these things that probably get thrown in the corner with all the other toys. And, uh, of course, in them days, money was short, and I just couldn't see where I could buy him a guitar. So I made him a proposition. Uh, he kept after me, so I told him one day, I said, I'll give you the pecan crop. There's two pecan trees in the backyard. If you pick the pecans, I'll sell them for you, and you'll be able to buy you a, a guitar. Well, I did every afternoon. We had a big sack of pecans, went down and sold them for $9. Daddy loaned me a dollar, and we bought a $10 Gene Autry guitar, and it was really something. Well, he was very well pleased, but uh, he, on account of his age and the length of his fingers, he had a hard time getting his hand around the neck of the guitar to be able to play it. So later on, uh, we managed to get him a guitar with a smaller neck that he could put his hands around and, and uh, one that he was able to play. Learning to play the guitar was a real problem for me. I bought all kind of guitar courses teaching you how to make a C card and F card. And finally, Daddy had a friend he worked with at the post office named Pooney Tatman. Pooney came over to the house and he showed me how to play the guitar and gave me some lessons. And I practiced and practiced till I learned how to make the C, F, G, E, D without even looking. That took years. And he practiced on that thing so much that it uh, almost run me nuts. Every time he hear me come in the house or come up the driveway, he'd shut it off and put it under the bed so I wouldn't raise his head with him. But that's, that's how he learned to play. As soon as Rod had mastered the guitar, he began playing publicly on a local radio program. 
Around 1950, I heard about Mr. Felix Desoche, who owned Redbird Sweet Potatoes and Desoche's feed store in Opelousas. He was starting a program to promote Redbird Sweet Potatoes, and I asked Mom and Dad to take me over there to listen to the music. Well, I wanted to sing, and they finally stood me up on some feed sacks and gave me a guitar, and I played jambalaya. Yes, Rodney Byrne, I'm singing jambalaya! <laughs> He practiced a lot and he, he did real well. He was well liked. So, uh, they kept pushing him and uh, Mr. Desoise would go on tours all over the United States and he took Rodney with him on several tours. And that's that's how he got started playing is in this uh, in this Desoise show. Uh, a uh, band, my goodness. That eventually led to what Mr. Dazars called the Blue Room Gang. I guess 15 or 20 of us from the Opelousas area that played instruments and sang all sorts of music. And every Saturday morning we had a 30 minute radio show on KSLO that was broadcast direct from the Blue Room in Dazars' feed store in Opelousas. Despite his age, Rod soon set his sights on hosting his own radio show. 1952, when I was about 12 years old, after three or four years at the Blue Room, I realized that it would be a lot of fun to have a radio show of my own. So I got all decked up in my western boots, my western shirt, cowboy hat, and went down to KSLO in Opelousas to meet with Johnny Wright, the program director. Johnny explained to me that it'd be okay, except I needed to have a sponsor. And that kind of disappointed me for a while, but I got home, and a couple of days later, I had a sponsor, Main Motors, the Lincoln Mercury dealer in Opelousas, and the Rod Bernard Show in KSLO started that year. Four years later, Rod joined a newly formed rock and roll band called the Twisters, a group which would eventually become an overnight success. It was about 1956 and Mike Genovese was forming a new teenage dance band in Opelousas called the Twisters. He invited me to sing with him and it was a real honor. I did. It was a bunch of musicians that joined the band, including my brother Oscar, Charlie Boudreaux, Charlie Lyman, Willie Harmon, Mike, and several others. And we played mostly rock and roll and rhythm and blues music, uh, songs like the Fats Domino music and Jimmy Reed, a lot of the black singers and white singers too, like Elvis, and a lot of the rock and rollers that were up and coming at the time. We played mostly on weekends, specifically on Saturday nights at the teenage centers around Opelousas and Eunice and Ville Platte, Mamou, in that area. At the same time, I was still working at the radio station as a DJ during the week uh, after school from 4 to 10 p.m. again on Saturdays and Sundays and having a ball. In 1957, Rod Bernard and the Twisters recorded two promising singles for the Carl record label. We got a little home tape recorder, hauled it down to Jake's music shop at all our instruments, stood around the counter, and recorded two songs we had written called Linda Gale and Little Bitty Mama. It was a terrible record, but we were really proud of it. The group's next release would prove to be successful beyond their wildest dreams. In 1958, the Twisters recorded This Should Go On Forever a song which sent Rod into the national spotlight and onto the national charts. Right after we graduated from high school in 1958, Floyd Swallow, who owned Floyd's record shop and Gin Records in Ville Platte, called and asked us to make a record for him. He told us we needed a couple original songs. The B-side was a song that I had written called Pardon Mr. Garden. For the A-side, we picked a song that Bernard Jolivet, who was better known as King Carl, had written and had recorded previously called This Should Go On Forever. I just had a gut feeling that uh, this song was a hit. And uh, I was new in the record business per se because this was going to be only the second English record release that uh, we would have released. Prior to that we had released only uh, some Cajun French recordings. So uh, I was most anxious to uh, uh, get going with my label and get a hit on the label and Rod uh, brought this song and I said definitely let's, let, let's get this thing recorded.